Like many of my secular YouTube colleagues, I had me a good old new atheist phase. Not long after I independently began to separate myself from my own Christian upbringing, I became aware of a growing movement of vocal atheism that was unabashedly antagonistic towards religious faith and dogma. The de facto leaders of this campaign were four old white dudes on whom were bestowed the cringeworthy moniker of the Four Horsemen of New Atheism. This isn't like a fan or media invented nickname, by the way. They made a DVD and intentionally called it that. The Four Horsemen are Richard Dawkins, whom Google describes as an ethologist when I thought this whole time that he made his living as a professional curmudgeon. The late Christopher Hitchens, who was similarly impudent, but nevertheless probably the only horseman that I'd actually have a beer with. Daniel Dennett, the secular Santa himself, and as of now the only one of the four who's managed to make himself more known for his actual academic work than defending against accusations of bigotry. And finally, Sam Harris, who at least these days is arguably the most visible and relevant of the group due to his popular podcast and very active online media presence. Now I could make a separate video for each one of these guys, but my personal relationship with the work of Sam Harris is the most tumultuous. So Sam gets a video. Hi, I'm T1J. Follow me. So before I get started, I want to say that this video is not intended to be some massive takedown of Sam Harris. But my feelings about Sam Harris have definitely evolved over the years, and I thought I'd talk about it. I became fascinated with Sam Harris after watching several videos of him debating people on the subject of religion. All of the other horsemen participated in such debates, but my boy Sammy had a unique wit about him. He was smooth and eloquent and funny. First of all, things are, have to be sort of situationally appropriate. I'm not constantly looking at my daughter thinking about she's just a part of the physical universe and wow, you know, neurotransmitters giving rise to all this cuteness. Uh, I mean, that's... That's not the mode I'm in. So, as you might imagine, consuming Sam Harris's videos and writings became a critical part of my identity as not only an atheist, but an anti-theist, which is a label I still more or less identify with. Now, these days, Sam Harris is arguably most well known for his strident opposition to Islam, and he's received no shortage of criticism for his remarks on the subject. In fact, reading criticism of Sam Harris is how I became most acquainted with the term Islamophobia, which I've argued many times on this channel is a bad term that lends itself to misuse. To this day, I agree with many things Sam Harris has said about Islam, the most obvious of which is the general notion that Islam, like most religions, is pretty garbage and bad for the world. Beyond that, I've also observed, as Harris has, that the left is often hesitant, if not completely unwilling, to criticize or lampoon Islam to the same extent as other ideologies, and routinely conflates objection to Islam as a set of ideas with bigotry against Muslims as people. In fact, the timid acceptance of the obviously backwards aspects of the scripture and traditions of Islam is the origin of the now infamous term, the regressive left. Unfortunately, that term has been driven deep, deep into the ground by opportunistic cretins. And I've defended Sam Harris on many occasions because it often seems that his detractors aren't that educated on his work or his worldview. People call Sam Harris right-wing, anti-social justice, white supremacist. One guy on Twitter told me that Sam Harris is, quote, essentially no different from Donald Trump. And these are all things that you would know are obviously not true if you've listened to Sam Harris even a little bit over the years. Sam Harris is obviously left-leaning socially and economically, vocally anti-Trump, and unlike many of his friends, he frequently acknowledges injustices faced by marginalized groups. So it's easy to dismiss criticisms of him when they're coming from people who don't even have a basic foundation of knowledge about who he is and what he believes. And while I do think that Harris vastly exaggerates the extent to which his critics maliciously misrepresent him, I do often see clearly dishonest takes on his statements. For example, this article from the Southern Poverty Law Center website which says, 
Under the guise of scientific objectivity, Harris has presented deeply flawed data to perpetuate fear of Muslims and to argue that black people are genetically inferior to whites. You'd have to research his statements for yourself, but I think this is a pretty misleading characterization of anything Sam has said. Ironically, my fandom of Sam Harris first began to crack because of his behavior and not necessarily his beliefs. Around this time, I began a period of deep self-reflection and I began to value compassion and tolerance more than things like confrontation and cynicism. Not to get too into this, but I was kind of an arrogant, self-absorbed little shit when I was younger and it resulted in me alienating a lot of the people who were close to me. And so I basically had an epiphany that I needed to do better. As I went through this change, I noticed that a lot of things that I really liked before no longer appealed to me. You know, like some of the characters I used to really identify with, like Daria or Tyler Durden, now just seemed pretentious and douchey. So I began to have a lot of questions for Mr. Harris. Like, why do you throw a public tantrum every time someone criticizes you? Why are you so quick to call every one of your detractors dishonest and malicious? Like, why can't you address these things without being a dick about it? You're a grown man. And as a result, it became less and less important to me to defend Sam Harris because I began imagining him less as an intellectual hero and more as a stubborn pedant that I just happen to agree with sometimes. To be fair, Sam Harris has talked about how social media often brings out the worst in him, and I can identify with that very strongly. I'm sure that I've lost a lot of followers after going too ham on Twitter. Either way, seeing these things happen so often made me more open-minded about criticisms of Sam Harris. But again, it's often hard to find intelligent, fair criticisms from people who actually seem to be familiar with Sam's actual views. But I realize that this may be by design. There's an argumentative strategy known as the Gish Gallop, in which a person overwhelms you with a lot of information and arguments all at once. This kind of thing is really hard to respond to adequately because you have to break down every claim and every statement and provide an intelligent answer to each one. This of course requires a lot of preparation and effort, much more effort than the galloper himself has expended to be sure. Because of this, users of the Gish Gallop often get away with weak arguments because their opponents are simply unable or unwilling to put forth the massive amount of energy it takes to debunk the onslaught of bullshit they've just been presented with. Sam Harris does this all the time. A close examination of much of Harris's writing reveals the fact that he makes a lot of vague, underdeveloped, or ambiguously worded claims without ever really elaborating on them before moving on to the next talking point. And when inevitably called out on these things, he becomes defensive, claiming that he's being misrepresented. And as I mentioned, he also usually accuses his opponents of deliberately strawmanning him because of some apparent conspiracy to ruin his reputation. But the problem is he fills these essays and articles with claims and arguments that I find it hard to believe he doesn't understand are provocative and controversial. Yet he responds with incredulous astonishment whenever people have a negative reaction. I can't believe you read my article titled In Defense of Profiling and are now accusing me of defending profiling. You must be intentionally trying to ruin my reputation. The aforementioned essay In Defense of Profiling contains the sentence, we should profile Muslims, or anyone who looks like he or she could conceivably be Muslim, and we should be honest about it. After noticing that people were understandably pissed off by this, he included an addendum where he wrote, I am not narrowly focused on people with dark skin. In fact, I included myself in the description of the type of person I think should be profiled, twice. To say that ethnicity, gender, age, nationality, dress, traveling companions, behavior in the terminal, and other outward appearances offer no indication of a person's belief or terrorist potential is either quite crazy or totally dishonest. The two times that Harris includes himself as a potential candidate for profiling at the airport are here when he writes, Although I don't think I look like a jihadi or like a man pretending not to be one, I do not mean to suggest that a person like me should be exempt from scrutiny. And later when he writes, and again, I wouldn't put someone who looks like me entirely outside the bullseye. But there are people who do not stand a chance of being jihadists, and TSA screeners can know this at a glance. Notice how each of those statements come with sly disclaimers. 
I don't think I look like a jihadi. I'm not entirely outside the bullseye. Even from before where he says, I'm not narrowly focused on people with dark skin. He's just broadly focused on them, I guess. It seems very clear to me that he's not really talking about people who look like him. But my point is not to respond to this specific article, but to demonstrate the argumentative tactics Sam Harris likes to use. His claims are so vague and quick that he still has access to deniability. He can accuse you of misrepresenting him because he hasn't really represented anything of substance to begin with. He doesn't really define what he thinks a Muslim looks like, because that's impossible to do. There are billions of Muslims in the world. So he can safely deny any characterization you ascribe to him. All we can go off of is what it sounds like he's implying. And since the vast majority of Muslims are brown, in this case it really sounds like he's implying that it's okay if brown people are subjected to more scrutiny in airports, because in his estimation, Muslims are more likely to be terrorists. And that's a racially oppressive system, which will almost certainly have more drawbacks than benefits. I've heard similar arguments with regard to black Americans. People say it's okay to profile black people because black people commit more crime than white people. Notwithstanding the fact that the level of racial bias is actually disproportionate to the amount of crime, this is still ridiculous. If you have a room with 100 people in it and one person does something bad, in my opinion you are not now justified in profiling everyone in the room. And I honestly don't think Sam Harris is racist, but even if he is, I don't care, it's just another racist white dude, I mean add it to the tally. But it does seem that he is much more concerned with self-absorbed indignation than he is with being thoughtful about how his ideas affect others and contribute to the spread of harmful oppression. In that same SPLC article I criticized earlier, they mentioned how actual white supremacists have literally cited Sam Harris as one of their stepping stones into the alt-right. And that's actually one of the things that I changed about myself over the years. I used to have this tireless insistence upon sticking to my principles and changing for no one. If you don't like me, fuck you. I know who I am and I know what I mean and I'm not responsible for other people's interpretations. And if you can't see my point of view, you're just too dumb or too sensitive to understand it. But the world doesn't work that way. Your words and actions have real effects on the people around you, especially if you have a large public platform. And you should give a shit about the impact of your words and how you make other people feel, even if you don't agree with their reasoning. Sam Harris would call this political correctness. I call it not being an asshole. Now, as I mentioned, I share Sam's antagonism towards Islam and most applications of theism. But a major criticism that he's received is that he is disproportionately hostile to Islam, which many people have suggested is evidence of a bigotry against Muslims. This is kind of funny because Sam's major criticism of the left is that they don't confront Islam enough. Meanwhile, people are criticizing him for doing it too much. Now, I'm pretty sure Sam would deny that he thinks Islam is worse than other religions on paper. But it's very clear that he believes Islam is more effective than any other religion when it comes to producing violent extremists. I mean, it's, it's a trope of um, political, co politically correct liberal apology around criticism of Islam. So, I mean, this, this notion of Islamophobia, the yeah. idea that, that to single out Islam for any special attention as a set of doctrines or as a political reality in, in today's world is tantamount to synonymous with or, or covertly motivated by racist bigotry toward Arabs or brown-skinned people. I kind of agree with Sam here. Just because you think something is worthy of special attention doesn't necessarily mean you have a bias against it. But if the attention you're giving that thing is misinformed or unfair, that's a whole nother story. Now while I've spent a lot of time looking into this, I am no Islam expert, and I have no doubt that Sam Harris has researched this topic much more than I have. But when you begin to read and listen to informed analyses of the Muslim world by experienced journalists and scholars, Sam's assessments seem very simplistic and lacking of nuance by comparison. The most obvious example is his insistence that the doctrine and traditions of Islam are the only or primary factors in radicalizing Muslims into violent extremists. I feel like even if you have a grade school understanding of world history and socio-political events, you can figure out that this sounds ridiculous. It's like saying crime in black neighborhoods is caused primarily by rap music. 
You can make an argument that it is a contributor, but it's obviously more complicated than that. But Harris is relentless in his refusal to acknowledge geopolitical factors that lead to radicalization of Muslims. And he only feels this way specifically about Islam and not extremists of other ideologies. In those cases, he's willing to acknowledge the nuance of complex political situations. But in general, with Islam, he argues that the religious doctrine is the primary or sometimes sole factor. The Quran is a much shorter, much more streamlined book, and it is all or it has a central message, which is very much in harmony with the example of Muhammad. Uh, it is not it, the, the 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 central message of the Quran, arguably, certainly a central message, is you you should spread this one true faith to the ends of the earth, and you spread this by conquest, not conversation. It is it is convert or die. Or if you happen to be a person of the book, you can live as a dhimmi. So Sam believes that the doctrines of Islam, including the Quran, the Hadith, and the historical example of Muhammad, are more likely than that of other religions to produce extremists because they're more clear and straightforward in their message of conquest and holy war. Now this is an assertion that's hard to prove or disprove, it's just sort of a thing that sounds right in Sam's head. And this is essentially the thesis of most of Sam's arguments about Islam. And since it's practically unfalsifiable, apart from someone creating another widespread religion similar to Islam and then us observing over the course of many decades whether or not it leads to widespread terrorism, it's very easy for Sam to dismiss any counter arguments. Such is the case with unfalsifiable claims. Fun fact, Beyonce and Jay-Z are sitting in this room right off camera. You can't prove it's not true, which is obviously evidence that it is true. So we're basically left to agree to disagree. Like I said, I don't think Sam Harris is racist or even anti-Muslim. If you take the time to really listen to the explanations of his arguments, it's difficult to honestly come to that conclusion in my opinion, unless you just don't believe him. He does seem to be very insensitive to how his ideas actually affect Muslims, but if he's so convinced that eliminating the unique evil of Islam is the only hope for the future of humanity, it's not hard to understand why. And he definitely seems to be convinced of that, so much so that he's willing to consider, whether hypothetically or not, normally unthinkable measures that would affect Muslims, such as racial profiling, torture, and nuclear first strikes. In my estimation though, the reasoning through which he came to these conclusions almost completely ignores historical and political precedent, and seems to be based chiefly on his own subjective convictions. Which I guess is fine, but it makes it hard to take very seriously. More recently, Sam Harris has been associated with a movement called the Intellectual Dark Web, which is a name that is only slightly less masturbatory than The Four Horsemen. This is a loosely associated group of writers and academics who made quite a wave on the internet as opposed to more traditional methods of spreading ideas. The group consists of people with different backgrounds and different political orientations. The thing that they all have in common is something in between concern and outrage over political correctness and what they perceive as overreaches of the left. You know that whole thing where folks on the left get mad when people say racist and transphobic shit? Huge problem facing society, apparently. Essentially, this is the exact same thing as the YouTube anti-SJW movement, except with more professional and academic credentials. As such, I have pretty much the same issues with it that I've had with the anti-SJWs, namely a disproportionate cherry picking of the worst examples of the left and almost complete tolerance and acceptance of the right, which I would argue is obviously a bigger problem. More focus on agenda and propaganda than actually getting facts straight and cozying up to the most unscrupulous and dishonest figures simply because it benefits their narrative. To Sam Harris's credit, he is somewhat less guilty of these things than many of the others. He has admonished segments of the intellectual dark web for being uncritical of Trump, for example. But it's clear to me that he's bought into this exaggerated hysteria regarding modern progressives. He lambasted Cenk Uygur of the Young Turks for allowing people like Reza Aslan to come on his show and make false and inflammatory statements unchallenged. But I don't think he's ever extended this criticism toward his friend Dave Rubin, another person who has been associated with the intellectual dark web. And that's like all Dave Rubin's show is. 
My suspicion is that since Dave Rubin has been an important contributor to this anti-left narrative, Sam Harris gives him a pass. He was willing to invite Charles Murray, a scientist who was violently protested at Middlebury College last year, on his podcast to discuss whether black people are genetically predisposed to having lower IQ than white people, which is at the very least controversial among psychological researchers. But one could argue that this idea was implicitly endorsed during their conversation. I'm convinced that, that discussion was mainly had to bolster Harris's anti-left agenda. That is, to create a narrative where Charles Murray is some kind of victim of censorship by big, bad, politically correct progressives, even though all he's doing is a little science. But in typical Sam Harris fashion, that's an obvious oversimplification. Sure, some people have a knee-jerk reaction to any discussion of race and intelligence, even if they're completely ignorant of the relevant data. But just as many people are concerned with presentation of debatable ideas as if they're settled science, especially ideas that can be easily latched onto and utilized by racists and those who wish for the downfall of already disadvantaged groups. So yeah, a lot of progressives have a very negative view of Sam Harris. I think this is in large part due to his unwillingness or inability to express himself in a concise way, making it very easy for people to interpret his ideas as bigoted or maniacal. I think that when you take the time to carefully process the things he's said over the years, it becomes obvious that he's not some crazy racist. But you shouldn't have to analyze multiple podcasts and dozens of hours of videos in order to decide whether or not someone is a bigot. Maybe it's you, Sam. But even if he isn't a racist, the vague and loose way he considers things like Islam and race science do more harm than good to the discourse surrounding them by providing pseudo-intellectual ammo to the weapons of actual racists. So I don't really have the same amount of disdain for Sam Harris as many other progressives do. He still often has interesting things to say about politics and philosophy, and his podcast is usually very good. But even so, the image that I once had of Sam Harris as this super intellectual genius who was saying the things that no one else wanted to say has been thoroughly tempered. He's a guy who seems to be driven entirely by his own personal principles and his own perspective, and he seems unconcerned with how his ideas might affect others. He's a person that's been right so often that I think somewhere down the line he lost the capacity to conceive of the possibility of him being wrong. That's just me though. What do you think? Thank you for watching my video. I look forward to all of the Sam Harris fans telling me how I have totally misrepresented him. If you'd like to support me or this channel, consider becoming a patron on Patreon. That would be awesome. See you later. Bye.